Is everyone ready? Fantastic. Welcome to this afternoon's panel on how Gen Y sees its economic future. My name is Liz Pearl. I'm the editor of the Youth Network at the Huffington Post Media Group in New York, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, first off, we have Marie-Francoise Damasen, who's the Executive Vice President of HR at Renault, to say a few words and give us some uh, background information on this panel. Thank you very much. First, I would like to say that I'm very happy to be on, on these panels, how Generation Y see its economic future. Of course, obviously, I'm a bit older than the member of the panel, but I hope <laughs> I will learn a lot from what you are going to say. Uh, I would like to say I am in charge of human resources for Renault, so it's 130,000 employees, and of course, Renault is the partner of Nissan with the Alliance, so at the end of the day, uh, we are very much involved in promoting diversity, and that's why uh, becoming a new generation, we are very interested in uh, uh, how uh, you see your economic future. Uh, I would like first to start my speech with uh, killing a few uh, usual preconceived ideas and stereotypes. Maybe you heard a lot about it uh, regarding Gen Y generation. Usually uh, what uh, people say that uh, Generation Y is individualist or even selfish generation, that you are impatient, moving in a culture of intimacy and discipline, more inclined to express your opinion than to uh, listen to people, that you are not interested in business anymore, and, uh, but that you are into in interconnected, uh, living with social network and glued to your smartphone. Um, we may too shortly come to the conclusion that uh, this generation is not interested in working in company and have a pessimistic vision of the future. Uh, honestly speaking, I think as a white generation, you have objective reasons to be less optimistic than the previous ones. Uh, you have experienced the economic crisis, even in emerging markets with the financial crisis. On mature markets as Generation Y, you have been witnesses the consequences of unemployment, sometimes seeing your parents fully dedicated to the company and just being at the end of the day uh, dismissed in time of crisis. And as well, I think for young adults, it's uh, difficult today to imagine that you are maybe going to less uh, to earn less than your parents uh, before. Uh, if we look at some data, if we look at the level of uh, youth unemployment in Europe, in the 27 country, it's more than twice the rate of total population for unemployment. So we have 23 in August, uh, and compared to 10.5 for the global population. And on top of that, in some countries like Greece uh, or Spain, we are more than 50%, which is really preoccupying. Um, I look at a US research, and that was conducted last year, and they said that 49% of the Y generation have just taken a job they don't like, but just to pay for the bills. 35% say, that they have to go back to school because there were no job. 31% I'm very, was very surprised when I saw these statistics said that they have postponed even getting married or having a baby because they couldn't afford it. And 24% said they have moved back to live with their parents because they couldn't afford to live on their own as they were doing before. But I don't think that this legitimate disillusion or lucidity leads to resignation, far from it. I think the why generation asking question why challenges our current patterns and practices, and it's really a generation in search of meaning. You may have seen some other study, the one from Mazar, which is, was uh, with this, uh, with this uh, team. And uh, what is very interesting is to see that rather than individualist or selfish, the Y generation put people at the heart of the business. 57% thinks that to succeed professionally, you need to have robust human qualities. Second, rather than not to be interested in business, young generation claim that they want more balance before profe between professional and personal life in a less materialistic approach. So happiness is ahead of all their objective and professional success is not the only way to achieve happiness. And rather than not listening to others, 
the Y generation is eager to learn throughout life, particularly by sharing ideas, sharing processes. So as Y generation, you are openly requested what everybody like to do without daring to express it. And I see much more characteristics which are assets in the business world that are compatible with the Y generation. For instance, importance of networking and capacity to work cross-functionally, ability to question and challenge, willingness to learn along all life long, flexibility, mobility, openness to the world. In fact, the world is the global village. Autonomy, creativity. So the approach is so different from the established models that it's really challenged the company. Why generation doesn't enter a company to make a long life career, but they want to take the opportunity to learn, to optimize their skill, and are ready to move out to a new job, a new position, even a new continent. So this is a very optimistic, pragmatic, lucid, and multidimensional vision of the economic future. So the question is more on our side. How can we adapt? How can the company can change their corporate culture? How they can cope with this requirement and to be much more flexible, fluid, cross-functional, broad and dynamic, mob mobile, more collaborative than hierarchical organization. So personally, I'm convinced as human resources executive vice president and as well as a mother of three generation Y at home, that the coming of this new generation is always a powerful engine to remain in movement, to challenge the company and to continue to improve. So as somebody said yesterday, I will uh, conclude, say invest in generation Y and generation Y will invest in you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mary Francois. Um, I will now introduce you to the incredibly accomplished and ambitious young women on the panel today. So first we have Imse Nilsson right here, and she is a youth policy expert. Imse has held the presidential position on the Council of Europe's Advisory Council on Youth and currently sits on the board of the European Youth Forum. She is pursuing a double bachelor degree at Stockholm University currently. And next to Imse, we have Julia Beliak, who is a 20-year-old entrepreneur living in Germany. She is studying business at the University in Munich and will pursue her master's in IT at Harvard University. Julia started her first company at 18 years old, and she's an ambassador for the I Love to Lead, which is a program for leadership development in young girls. And next to Julia, we have Xu Young Wang, who's a Master II Commerce student at the prestigious ESCP Europe. In 2008, she began interning in banking, which included China Merchants Bank. She also spent three months in Nairobi with the UN Environmental Program, and this summer she finished her internship at OECD in Paris. Next to Xu Young, we have Claire Johnson, who has an MBA from the Wharton School and an MA in International Studies in Arabic from the Lauder Institute. She is a consultant at the Bain Johannesburg office and co-leads their women's organization. And on the end, we have Julia Zelliger, who's from Germany, and she became involved in the Green Party at a young age. In 2006, she was selected into the governing council of the party. She has a degree in technical journalism and um, worked for the TAS, which is a left-wing newspaper in Germany. She is currently writing a book about international communication and in particular trolling. Those are our panelists. Um, and I'll jump right into the questions and um, we're going to take audience questions at the end. I know our panelists are very keen to talk to you. So. To start off, I'd like to know, and we'll start with you, Imse, are you optimistic or pessimistic overall um, about your economic future and that of your generation? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I look forward to your questions in the end, uh, which I think will be the best part of this session. Um, to answer your question, I am a very optimistic person, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. But on behalf of my generation, I'm not so optimistic. I'm rather quite pessimistic. You heard a few of the numbers presented, which I think talk for themselves. I mean, 50% of the youth population in Greece and Spain are without a job, they're without education and they're without training. I mean, they're completely excluded from society and that is just not acceptable uh, because we are losing a generation uh, and they are at risk of serious health issues, uh, physical health issues and mental health issues and this is just not 
the type of society I want to live in. Um, and that's even beyond economic kind of welfare. It's, it's welfare in their life and, and well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'd, I'd love for each one of you actually to field this question if that's okay. Thank you. Um, the way I see it is that you have to divide the Generation Y into two major groups. And I don't talk about um, regional groups or anything like this because I would say we are very homogenous amount, like people that have very similar values. Um, but actually values is the most important key thing here because the Gen Y people that live by the old values, the old standards that uh, we, were, we learned from our parents or grandparents, for them I am very pessimistic actually about their economic future. But uh, for the young people that actually embrace the change in the world, things like globalization, um, being mobile, um, or having a different kind of approach to education, which we're going to talk about later, um, for them I'm actually quite optimistic. So I think really the key is changing the way you see the world, being kind of entrepreneurial, uh, seeking opportunities and see, uh, seizing them. And uh, then I'm quite sure that the future for those people will be quite optimistic. Uh, hello, my answer will be very short. I'm very optimistic about Chinese future economy and uh, GY's future. Um, because uh, although China is suffering a slowdown in economic growth, but uh, as we all, um, there will still be more and more job opportunities and you know a lot of FDI in China. So uh, the government is favoring students. And uh, I think it's mainly depending on uh, the circumstance, uh, circumstances you compete with others. And uh, as a global uh, environment, you need to be very uh, you know, uh, overwhelming to compete with other students. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I, um, this might sound funny after uh, all the challenges we've just talked about, but the reason that I'm optimistic, there, there's two main reasons I'm optimistic. The first is that I think it's, uh, for our generation, it, and always, it, it's less about the, the challenges that are faced, but more about the people who are facing those challenges. And I think in our generation, um, more of the best and the brightest have access to the highest levels of, in, uh, of institutions, to leadership positions. Uh, this is partially because Organizations are seeking diversity, um, and this is everyone from MBA programs to companies to, to governments. Uh, I think as of 50 years ago, was th those organizations were run by a, a very small sector of, of our global society, mostly white, straight men, and now they're open to people across genders, uh, different ethnicities, um, regardless of sexual orientation. Not completely, but more and more. Um, and I think that's very exciting, because the best and the brightest minds sit across all of those groups. Um, the second thing that I think is driving the, well, I, that I hope is driving the, the top minds into leadership positions is increasing access to information. So you see greater competition for those positions as the organizations become uh, more open, but also because more people can, can apply to them. For example, over the last 40 years, um, we've seen the, the applications to Harvard go up by 400%, which is incredible. Uh, that's from about 8,000 applications to 35,000. Um, and so I think that th that's, that makes the organization more selective and, and, and I hope is, is making the smartest, most creative people rise to the top of them. The second thing that makes me optimistic is, is that I think we're at a point more than any other time since the Industrial Revolution where we're thinking about, and this is coming out of a crisis, uh, about how do we have good growth? How do we create sustainable growth? Um, we focus more on improving health, education, uh, developing uh, civil society, um, and ensuring that our companies are operating in a sustainable way, I think, than any other point since, since the Industrial Revolution. So that's my perspective. Okay, um, I'm from Germany, and Germany is uh, the uh, winner of the Euro crisis, and so um, I can be a little bit optimistic. Um, and uh, if I watch myself as a European, um, my optimism is uh, decreasing, it's uh, not so good, and uh, as she said, uh, many young unemployed people, and they all have no perspective. And uh, as I'm a people living on the world, and um, I'm really pessimistic uh, because of the climate change, and um, I'm not, there's nothing happening in uh, decarbonization, and um, re renewable energies are uh, at a very, very small state, and um, I'm very pessimistic in the case of the climate change. Um, 
But um, there's also the internet, and the internet makes me optimistic, uh, of course. Uh, you have communities, uh, you have some kind of neighborhood, you have um, relationships there that can be um, played on, and I think if you take the right services on the internet, and uh, the right service is not Facebook, I think, the right service are uh, services that fit to you and that are open services, uh, then you can create communities um, that have a real good impact on the world and make the world a better place. Mm, but, um, okay, um, as I said, uh, Facebook and Apple and all the big companies, uh, I'm not so optimistic with that they want um, a free and open and communicating uh, networking society. I think they want just the data and uh, to sell their stuff and to have an internet of consumers and that is not uh, such a good idea. I want to change that. Great, thank you. Um, do you guys feel like your, gen your generation has access to the tools they need to get a job? Claire, I know you mentioned education being one of them. Do you want to jump in and field that? Sure. Um, I, I can start. I think yes and no. Um, so the, the two countries outside the U.S. where I've spent the most time have been Egypt and South Africa, where I currently live. And both of those countries have had significant increases in education, uh, particularly in the last... 20 or 30 years. Um, I, I believe South Africa's gr college graduates have gone up from something like 80,000 to 120,000 per year in that time. So big increases. But at the same time, uh, there's huge unemployment in South Africa. I think I recently read that 600,000 uh, college graduates in South Africa are unemployed. So what does that mean? I think, I think education is part of the story, uh, but I'm not sure that, that we're doing education in the right way. So. Uh, it, both in South Africa and, and especially in Egypt, education is done in a very rote, repetition, content-based based way as opposed to um, trying to train people to be more innovative. Um, Julia and I were talking just before the panel about how it's really important in, in our, our generation to create your own path. And I'm not sure that our education systems are, are doing that. Um, so I think that we need to invest more in more creative types of, ener uh, of education. Do any other panelists have a response for that as well? Only if you want. I can follow on that. Um, what I see education, and especially formal education doing, is, is to teach you knowledge, but it doesn't teach you skills for life, and it doesn't have a lifelong aspect uh, in the way you are taught. At least that's my perspective and, and what I've learned, and I've been in all types of, of educational systems. Um, what I'd like to see more of is especially for companies to kind of accept that young people also need other skills. I mean, not everybody will learn in the same way. Not everybody functions in the formal education system. There are also informal systems. You have youth organization, which is, I guess, what I'm representing today. You have the whole civil society teaching young people extremely good skills in terms of presentation, teamwork, uh, kind of learning how to live their lives. Um, and that is not recognized, uh, which I think is a shame. And, and if we want to talk about access to tools, then I believe that more funding for civil society organizations is a tool that needs to kind of be emphasized um, because formal education today, as, as uh, Claire said, is just not really good enough. And especially if you still will enforce fees on formal education, then only a few will actually access that type of tool. Um, I come from Sweden, which might be why I'm saying that fees for, for formal education is not really a good system, because we don't have it. We haven't had it for so many years. But, but if I compare it to other countries, I see an, an exclusion in the type of people that actually access this. And they, a lot of other people have to work very hard to fund their education. And I don't think that's a fair system for young people on a broader scale. Um, so. I would say no. There are tools there, but not everybody has access to them. Did you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, first of all, about tools. Um, especially in the Western world, I would say yes, we do have the access, but I think the main difference between our generation and the previous generations, who might have had some of those tools as well, is that we really rely on them. Because <clears throat> we really have to be self starters. We have a complete responsibility of our own economic future, of our 
career, everything, because I think the past generation had something like a guiding hand or this advice that worked for most people of stay in school, get good grades, get a good degree, get a secure job, stay there your whole life, those kind of things. Whereas we don't have that and um, we have a lot of different opportunities which we need to select very wisely because they will basically decide about our future and so it's important to use those tools for that. And what makes me a bit pessimistic is that many people don't know how to use those tools. Many people say um, they're too busy or just overwhelmed by the amount of information. So I think that's a critical thing that would have to change is to show people more how to use those tools. Um, like for example, one thing I did is participating in a program called I Love to Lead, um, where like I would really recommend all of the girls here on the panel and other girls to do that because that shows you how to teach, uh, how to learn some of those um, tools or how, some of those skills. So um, you have to really take an initiative and go out there and make the use of those amazing programs out there. So. Okay, uh, something a little bit provocative. Um, uh, it happened in my life and I had very good chances, I think, uh, that I began to decrease and um, now at the moment uh, I'm at the state of my life that I'm moving back to my mother, just as you said, uh, that it's typical for Generation Y. I had a blog at a big German newspaper and then I couldn't manage that and um, it went worse. And I think it's not so simple as you say it, that you can take your chance uh, with the internet. I think there are many people, um, I, when I researched before, uh, there was mentioned a generation chips that was the opposite of the generation Y. And um, I can, it could be that uh, there are many people that are just watching internet movies and uh, having some chips and being on Facebook, chatting, not uh, because um, they w don't want to take their chance, because um, rather than uh, because they have no perspective. And then their thinking goes down and down and down and then they have to move back to their mother and they have no perspective anymore. I think uh, that can happen. And um, it's not just a kind of education, it's also uh, something of perspectives on the uh, working market, I think. On that vein, Julia, if you want to keep the microphone, I'd love to know what, what role you think technology will play in the future careers of your generation. Um, of course, technology is all around us and we have to um, deal with it uh, because uh, it won't go away uh, anymore. And we have to watch every uh, service and every uh, kind of te technology, just as uh, Apple computers or Facebook or uh, free software. Um, and on its impact on society and on economy. And um, I think um, you have to choose uh, that services and that uh, hardware that is um, the right one for you. And uh, technology can connect people and also real simple technology. Um, an example is um, I'm connected with uh, many uh, friends that are ba brain workers in the IRC channel. Uh, who knows IRC? It's a protocol from the 90s and the people uh, chatted bef just be before there was uh, the WWW uh, or the WW, I don't know, WWW. Uh, WWW. Um, they had other services and they had IRC and connected together. And this is really interesting because um, you, ha you can have uh, intellectual communities together um, if you want it. And other people need other services. Uh, everyone has to choose that one that is good for him and everyone has to uh, check um, what that service is doing, if the data is given away and um, if it's good for you or if uh, it makes uh, a bad thinking the service. Because I think Facebook is a very bad environment for people. Uh, you just like and chat and it's not, um, there's no, uh, interesting thing coming in. You, you can sell stuff there, but it's, uh, I would uh, avoid uh, using Facebook very often for um, my jobs. How do you feel about networking though? And this can be to anyone on the panel, just at using it as you know, social networks. I know the Mazar study um, that you mentioned earlier um, said that Generation Y in general um, believes that networking is almost more important than technical skills um, in terms of getting a job. Do any of you agree with that? 
Um, I would definitely say that's the case, and because uh, statistics show it, and also my own experience shows that just with a normal application that you hand in to someone you don't know, you don't, your chances are not that great. Um, especially because of those stereotypes against uh, Gen Y, because people think, okay, she's 20, what does she know? You know, where would we take her? So um, I think events like this are extremely important to network and actually show that Gen Y is different from <coughs> the negative stereotypes. And I think social networking definitely plays a very big role into that. I mean, I've been statistics like, I think about 40% of employment decisions are actually now made based on something that people found on social networks. So like LinkedIn, Facebook, um, I agree also about uh, Facebook, it can be dangerous if it's not managed. And that's actually <clears throat> my point about technology is that you need to really watch out and you need, need to really learn a lot about it. And I think it's not very good that there's not a lot of trainings about it because you can't avoid technology, especially in our generation, but no one really teaches us how to use it. And um, because there are many good, yeah, difficulties, um, like one thing I had, for example, with my own company when I was 18, uh, I had to work with uh, virtual teams. Um, basically with some programmers in India and no one before told me like what it is like or talking, working with someone who's on the other side of the world basically. So those kind of trainings are going to be extremely important in um, corporations and have to be uh, put there. Um, but another thing also is since we are the first generation of digital natives, I think we, we are quite good in those things already and I think there should be more of a dialogue between the different generations where we learn from each other because I think but basically a lot of um, generations before us think again, yeah, they don't know each other, what can we learn from them? Uh, we shouldn't even hire them because they're you know, like lazy or provocative or <laughs> those things. But I think actually we can both learn a lot from each other. So. That's great, thanks. And this next one I'd like to direct at you, Xu Young. Um, how do you see the big issues? So for example, the environment or debt or the global skills competition as impacting uh, your economic future? Uh, let me first, I want to add something about secondary gen uh, sure, of education. Course. Great. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, as uh, China is more and more developed, uh, more and more students got a chance to uh, go to the college or universities. Uh, let me give you some uh, figures to, uh, to say. In cities, that 80% of uh, young people go to colleges or universities. And uh, from uh, 1978 to this year, 2012, uh, our uh, number of graduates is rising from uh, 0 0.2 million to uh, 6.8 million this year. So you can see there's a huge growth and even the number of uh, institutes or universities grow from uh, less than 250 schools to 2,250 schools. It's almost uh, 10 times of growth. And uh, even uh, like more, uh, more and more students, when they finish their uh, undergraduate study, they choose to go abroad and uh, to broaden their vision uh, to study uh, for master or PhD. And uh, also I think China uh, during these years has doing a transformation from a labor intensive uh, society to skill intensive or knowledge intensive society because you know uh, we first established our um, most of our we don't have cities and uh, most people work in the countryside and uh, live for agriculture but now uh, China want to uh, cultivate more and more students who is uh, uh, who is very skilled in global uh, competitiveness and uh, uh, something like that and also um, I will I would also like to uh, say some drawbacks about technology because um, we have to admit that uh, high technology internet, computer brought us a lot of benefits. But there's a little uh, joke I heard just a few days ago. It's um, about old saying, we all heard about it. It's about an apple a day keeps a doctor away. I believe all of you have heard that. But the second meaning of this sentence will be, if you play in Apple products every day, you won't get your PhD degree. <laughs> so, uh, but, but it's, somehow reflects uh, the reality in China uh, because now uh, some people, some young people are addicted to games, uh, especially on those smartphones and pads. I remember when I have a, a huge family gathering in Beijing last year, I have a young cousin who is only three years old, but she knows very well how to play each video on her iPad. 
and I was so uh, astonished to see that. But we can also see that um, because of this, that maybe it somehow distract you from your work. Uh, from even I heard a white collar uh, man spent like half of his salary on video games, online games each month. So. I think we, um, as we benefit from internet and this high technology, we also need to, maybe GX should focus on the future influence of young people of this high technology. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sorry, Go ahead, uh, just to sort of think about what you just said and as well about the, <coughs> the question on networking versus technology. I think with our generation, it's, it's assumed that we'll know how to use the technology, and we do. And so networking is actually the way that we want someone can distinguish themselves. I, I, too often I see um, friends, peers, go through only the technology route. So they've made a million connections on LinkedIn, they've submitted their application to a million different websites, uh, but they haven't actually gone and met someone face to face. And that's still what matters at the end of the day. Um, and I think, I think that we, we do fall into this trap and we do rely on our technology and kind of fiddle with it too much sometimes. Great, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I could uh, add, uh, uh, if you think about this uh, world of pictures, uh, could be, uh, uh, that could be the matrix. Think about that. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, yeah. jump in. Um, no, about the whole educational topic, since you brought it up. Um, I can just share my personal experience. Like when I was 18, um, I was faced with a very difficult decision of uh, whether I should go to Oxford and get my degree there, get the whole theoretical knowledge, all those uh, things which my whole family and school really urged me to do, of course. And on the other hand, um, starting my own company, which was what I was passionate about. And um, I think this is exactly what lots, lots of um, Gen Y people ask themselves, you know, should I follow the kind of traditional route or should I follow my Gen Y passions in a way? And um, I talked to many amazing people back then and tried to just get some um, yeah, inspiration on what to do in this uh, topic. And um, I really saw also this kind of different value system and depending on which company, which kind of people or where they worked, uh, who I asked. And uh, actually like, the decision wasn't based on uh, a top manager at Google who I um, met at that time and talked to him about this. And he said that if I start my own company at age 18, and even if it fails, if it's a disaster or whatever, they're much more likely to take a person like that than if you have the top degrees from Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, because um, this kind of practical um, education is valued much more nowadays. So that's a um, big sh yeah, shift that's going on right now in the educational system. <laughs> that's exactly my point about skills <laughs> that you learn outside of school. Um, in terms of what's most urgent, uh, I heard the other day that most of the, the things that young people are faced with today in terms of social exclusion are nothing new. Um, so, I mean, we have a recession at the moment, but we can't blame every problem in society on the recession. Uh, and I think we have to kind of keep that in mind when we find solutions and when we seek solutions that the, some of the solutions have to be short term, some of them really have to be long term to kind of build a better society. And, and I'm very happy that I have such a passionate panel with me that really wants to, to change society and feel very optimistic uh, in terms of our generation because I think we can. Um, to Julia's point about Gen Y um, sort of following non-traditional routes often, I wonder what you guys think the, I guess the, what you would like to see the generation currently holding power do differently for your generation. Me. Sure. Any, any, it's, uh, and yeah, Julia, do you want to, do you want to start at the end? Well, no, no, I, I, I listen to the question because... Oh. Oh, no. Well, the, the question was, what would you like to see the uh, current generation holding power do differently for your generation? Do any of you want to jump in? Um, this is one of the stereotypes that young people don't have power or that we are the future generation. I'm here today. I have power. I worked in institutions. Um, and this is also a mind shift that has to change. Young people are not the future. We are here today and we want power at least all the young people that I represent in youth organization, everything we say all the time is, let us in, in the power structures, let us be at the table where the decisions are made. Um, and this is what I'd like to see changing, that you, you can't take a decision on behalf of someone else without kind of letting them be part of it. 
Uh, and if you look at local level, a lot of municipalities have these kind of, or at least in Sweden, um, this system of, of a youth council, uh, which is only a representative body. They're only there kind of as a show off, uh, but they're not actually let in where the power is, which is in the actual municipality, in the council. And I think this probably goes for, for companies as well. Uh, you can't just have alibi young people because they look good on posters or in brochures when you're looking for new uh, workforces. Um, you kind of also have to give them power and opportunities. And I've heard a lot of uh, kind of, we want to invest in, in young people, we want to invest in this and this, and this is good. Uh, but you have to give them power as well. Um, I definitely agree with that. That's uh, one of the main points I wanted to say that there is a lot of negativism about our generation and this really has to go because we have a lot to say, we have a lot to offer and I would like the currently yeah, economic uh, power holding generation to really appreciate and give us a chance to you know, show what we um, can do. And the second thing is going back to education and this change in values and change in what is necessary for um, in order to compete internationally because I think of all the um, challenges in the world um, the international the global skills competition is going to be the most important thing because um, We know our generation knows and this that's why we're kind of pessimistic because we know there is someone in, in Asia or another Quickly developing uh, country who has similar qualifications and will do the same job for a fraction of the price So we need to kind of think of a ways what how we what we can do about that and um, that has to start with education because those kind of things that are valued in Europe, those kind of, you know, the, the left brain things, the logical things, the, you know, math or IT or like bookkeeping, those kind of jobs, they will not bring us far in our generation because that's something that I think like also the Asian market is very, very good at. And um, currently, at that, since they have a lower wage than we do right now, um, they will win this competition. And I think what we need to focus on is the other side, the creative side, and we need to train people to be designers, be in marketing, be good storytellers, uh, be creative. And the current educational system actually does exactly the opposite by killing down creativity, by forcing you into the box of thinking. So that's what definitely will have to change. And uh, the thing I, w I want to say here is, um, you know, China will be facing a serious problem of aging society in the next 50 years, I guess. The, people, the proportion who is on over 16 years old will be, uh, like, let's say, a large proportion of the society. So um, this lie a problem for young people is because, uh, like, uh, the two people, the a couple should, um, because we have the culture to, how to say, to, uh, take care of our old parents. So for uh, two young, uh, one young couple, they should take care of not only their children, but also four parents from both families. This could be a, a huge uh, economic burden for young people. And also, as um, I don't know if you know, the housing price in China is really very high. And uh, like I, because I'm from Beijing, um, the average price for buying a house is uh, 40,000 yuan. Um, that's equal to 4,000 4, euro uh, per uh, square meter. And the average salary uh, in Beijing is only uh, $2,000 a year. So uh, it's really, you have to work like more than 30 years to pay back your house. And um, I would like to say, I would like to see maybe in the future the Chinese government will uh, uh, put some policy that maybe lower in the price of house or, uh, or favor the young people who is buying the house. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see both the generation in power and, and like you were saying, our generation as well because I think we should be doing this together, not so separately. But think about business more holistically uh, and think about the purpose of business not only for the bottom line and for profitability but also for creating positive employment, empowering employment, uh, responsible, safe products, positive impacts on the environment. Um, and I'm, I look forward to growing business in, in that way. Uh, I think uh, power is always there, but it can't be given. It has to be taken and there will, I th of course it's really neoliberal to think like this, but um, people will come and take uh, the power. In Germany, um, it's not so, not so bad as in under other countries, as I said, because we are uh, winners of the Euro crisis. And I think um, 
it's it's um, it will work in some way. <laughs> What do you think is the most urgent issue your generation faces? I know we've talked a lot about education and, and touched on a few more, but I know I, it, before uh, this panel we were talking a bit about the environment. Is that some, is sustainability something on your minds? Uh, because I used to intern in uh, UNEP, United Nations Environment Progr Program in Nairobi. Um, uh, I'm uh, mainly in charge of uh, like putting news on Ren Ren. I don't know if you know, know new Ren Ren. It's a Chinese version of Facebook. Yeah, it has uh, like almost uh, three million of uh, users. And also, um, um, my main job there is to put news of uh, animals and what we do in UNEP every day on Ren Ren. We have like a, uh, I don't know, it's one million of fans, who followers, who follow us every day on the news, and they will give their opinions and their ideas about how to protect the environment, and it's very useful for us to know, to share the ideas. I think environment will be a main focus of Chinese future development, uh, because now more and more enterprises are uh, promoting like green economy, and we like to share the ideas with the world. I think, and I touched on this earlier, but I, I think this issue of youth unemployment is, is huge. Uh, as we've had this, the, these rising uh, levels of education, we have a lot of very smart, very capable people without jobs, without stimulation, um, with not much to do with their time. And I think that we need to be more creative about how we, how we use educated people, what, what kind of opportunities we can create, uh, especially in developing countries, especially in, in countries in Africa. I think uh, youth unemployment is connected to something uh, kind of completely different, but also very, very relevant. Uh, young people, uh, at least I've heard this, uh, feel more and more disbelief in democracy. Uh, and I think that's also quite an urgent issue, uh, because if you are socially excluded, of course you're not going to believe in the way your country or your nation or, or your society is run. Uh, and this on a long-term scale will also damage our society and, and definitely on a global scale, uh, not just on a national scale or, or a European Union scale. Um, and I think the key here is, is, as we said, to find a solution to youth unemployment, to put these young people in some kind of stimulation, to give them training, to recognize the skills they have, to give them some kind of opportunity and meaning in their lives. Uh, because it is damaging to just sit at home and do nothing and feel that you have no future whatsoever. Um, and there are things that you can do, uh, if so unpaid, uh, which shouldn't have to be the first option, but at least give them something to do. And I think here the whole society has to take responsibility. Uh, civil society, the, the private sector and the public sector, I think everybody can kind of dig in. Uh, I heard that Coca-Cola are investing in f 5 million uh, uh, young entrepreneurs. That's more or less the same number of young unemployed people in Europe today. Um, so, I mean, I think you can do that kind of link yourself. Um, yeah, just on the issue of issues <laughs> we're facing, I think it's not really like uh, that one of the, or the other is more dominant. I think the biggest problem is that there are just so many and we are bombarded with all of them and we have to solve all of them and we don't feel like we get the support from others to really sort those things out. Um, of course we're very concerned also about things like the environment but the, I mean like five years ago where we had, I know like when I was still like in high school and we kind of had our, you know, time to, to deal with those kind of things, it was a huge issue. I was actually the leader of an environment club, we had a very uh, great group and everything and people really cared. But now, the more we close, and, uh, the more we move into the um, working sector, the more we're bombarded with, you know, global skills competition, youth unemployment, all of those things that we need to, you know, deal with first, just you know, to secure our future position. So, if people would help us with those issues and, you know, take our hand and guide us through it, then we could definitely also go back to those kind of global issues like global warming and the like. Um, I, I want to talk about one thing that's striking me uh, in Africa, because. Um, I, I lived there for a few months and I uh, saw, I, I did a program to helping like poor people. And I went to their houses, I really see the, their conditions and the, the, 
let's say that it smells like rubbish uh, everywhere and really live in a very poor house and uh, with uh, limited uh, tools to education and something. And also I want to stress here is um, uh, now we we have a problem is that many developed countries, they throw, uh, how to say, sell their um, used uh, computers into uh, African countries, leads to a lot of electricity rubbish to African children. And I think it's very, um, it's bad for their growth. And I, I think we all need to pay attention to it. Yeah, of course, um, I think that um, the climate problem is far away, but it's, it's the hardest. But I, I would agree that, um, that of course, youth unemployment and unemployment and all the social problems that are increasing uh, have to be solved. There, there has to be a solution. Um, I would, uh, you can read uh, an article about my, um, about this panel I wrote on my blog, you can find it. I wanted to say that. Um, but um, I think uh, the climate problem is really huge and um, I think it's not a good, um, it's very hard uh, to do it just in uh, environment clubs. I think it's, it's much bigger and uh, you have to go uh, to the production and you have to go to the public, um, what the public sector is using, you, you can't go just on, on your private consumption. You really have to think about that. It's, it's no solution to say, okay, I'm just buying ecological stuff and that's uh, nothing. Great. I'd love to pause there and open this up for uh, questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? You can raise your hand and then stand up. No one yet? All right, well, I'll ask. Oh, yeah, go ahead. When you're talking about the Chinese schools, were you talking about universities or high schools? Or uh, universities and colleges, yeah. Great, I'll we'll jump in with another one. What do you guys feel is the, uh, the biggest false stereotype about your generation? It's a big one, you can take a second if you want. Oh, got it. <laughs> As I wrote in my blog uh, article, I think uh, there is no generation Y and uh, today on the internet generation, uh, of course you can uh, say, okay, we are one in the same time, but um, I think it's some kind of uh, projection to say there's a generation Y. Anyone else? You hearing any, I know, you know one of the typical ones you always hear is, you know, they're lazy and always on their computers. Yeah. But. Yeah, I think I think that uh, our generation maybe is a little bit underestimated when you when you characterize it in that way. Uh, I mean, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to answer this question without sounding like, no, we're not. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> this is how we are. <laughs> um, uh, you know, or bragging or something along those lines. But I, I think our generation is really exciting. You know, I, you've seen. Uh, new movements come out of our generation that, that you haven't seen for a long time, like the Occupy movement. And I wasn't a member of it, but I think it's exciting. And you do see people taking action. Uh, you've seen huge movements around climate change, even if they're not driving the change that we want to see yet. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the, my biggest message would, would be don't underestimate us. <laughs> you know, we may communicate slightly differently. We may spend more time on our computers, uh, but we're passionate and we're excited about the future. <laughs> That's a good one. What are, the, what are the things we offer and what are the disadvantages of having to work for them? <laughs> Who's going to be brave on that one? <laughs> um, I think a big thing is the structure because your generation is it's very everything is more formal more structured there's a hierarchy there's a procedure behind everything there's bureaucracy there's uh, you know a work time where you have to be in the office there's rules regulations you know uh, instead of talking about things you, you write like like a thousand page manuscripts about you know what to do in a certain situation so those are things that are very very different in our generation because for us flexibility is key um, if we have our job done, we want to go home. If we, um, you know, like, we, we, we need to, you know, combine many things together and we need to be more flexible. And when we have an issue, I think that's, that's also, like, to the past, to the previous questions, a big stereotype is that we shock people a lot because we're very bold and we say what we want and we 
just you know have, are not really scared to even go to, up to the CEO and say, hey, can we talk for a second? I have this and this issue, and um, so that's going to be really important that you know we kind of cross this kind of the hierarchies, we cross those boundaries, we cross those structures because we need it in order to succeed in our life. So. I'm going to answer slightly different. Uh, stereotypes are usually based on prejudices, uh, and prejudice is based on lack of knowledge. Um, I am not, as my colleagues here, uh, a stereotype is that all of us are extremely active on social media. I can confess that I don't have a smartphone. Uh, you probably thought I do, because I am of a certain age. Um, so I think it's very difficult to answer whether or not categorize people, I would rather not say that this generation is this and this generation is that, because I believe that we all have different values and experiences, and you kind of have to recognize that. Um, my life goal is probably not the same as, as these people next to me, uh, even though we are more or less the same age. Uh, so I, I find it very, very challenging and, and also difficult that we tend to categorize that largely, even though there are uh, research done on this age group is like this and this, but you also have to see the individual every, everywhere, every time. Does anyone else have a question? How do you guys feel about gender diversity in the office um, in, or in the workplace in general? I know that, again, the Mazar study that you mentioned um, said that Generation Y apparently don't know what the glass ceiling is before they start working, but two years after being in the office, that is something they become aware of. Do you feel like that will be a focus of your generation? Um, it's true that we don't really know initially what it is and are maybe a bit naive when it comes to that because I personally thought that you know I'm, I'm 20 now and I'm still kind of in the academic sector more where girls do dominate in many ways um, have the better grades have you know uh, liked by the teachers and professors um, so there there's no problem really and so we kind of go out into the workforce with closed eyes. But I talked to many people um, over the past days that say, yeah, well, wait until you know you get married or you have your first baby or you know want to get the C-suite position, you'll see. So that kind of scares um, us up a bit. But still, I think there is optimism because in the current world, it's all about skills. So if you can really prove that you know you, have, you possess certain skills. And some skills that, that are that women have, um, like listening or empathy, that are a bit more maybe uh, dominant in, in women, are going to be extremely important in the future. So, I hope very much that uh, there's going to be a change in the future, definitely. I think that there's two things, maybe three things that that come to mind uh, for me. The first is that this conference has been really exciting for me. It's been really exciting to see so many senior, successful, professional women. And it made me realize that um, I've never seen so many <laughs> in one place before. Uh, which, and, I've, and of course, I've been around tons and tons and tons of professional men. Um, so that's one. The, the role models are actually much more important to me than I ever would have thought that they are. So thank you. Uh, the second is that I think, um, I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done the work that's been done so far is, is fantastic. We, for example, at my company, that we have very, very strong policies. I feel very supported. Uh, I feel like I have a career path, et cetera. I, I think that there are still, even in very progressive companies, um, I can't imagine that there is not always uh, some level of ambivalent sexism. So there are some assumptions around who I will be as an employee, as a professional, because I am a woman. And some of those are good, and some of them are probably not good. And I, uh, I think that will be the work of this generation is to understand what those are, um, bring awareness to any biases that exist, maybe tackle the ones that are, are harmful, uh, but really make our, our, com our companies as, and our organizations, I don't mean to make this all corporate, uh, uh, as feminine as they are ma masculine. Um, the third thing is, is that uh, as I'm, I'm 29, so I'm, I'm beginning to think about family, uh, I think that um, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that women have strong career paths through their 30s and that we manage maternity. I don't think that that's an issue that's, that's been solved yet, um, and I'm certainly still looking for great solutions. Um, okay, um, on the internet and in the feministic internet blogs, we have had a big debate about that pink 
uh, stuff. And um, I don't know if you heard, I think you have heard about it, that uh, for young children, um, the uh, gender stereotypes have, have come much harder, that uh, girls uh, are wearing uh, pink uh, clothes, uh, that girls get pink um, bikes, and that was not like this uh, when I was young. I think this is interesting, and uh, we have to watch that. Um, one thing that makes me uh, optimistic is that uh, quota debate. Um, of course, I'm always pessimistic, and I'm always pessimistic in gender stereotypes because I think it's a very private thing, and if you are in your relationship, um, it will come again and again, and sexism is always there, and um, it's really hard to combat, and it's always also at work. I, I also had problems with uh, my chef and a sexistic uh, language at the left-winged alternative newspaper. It, it's really always there, and uh, you have to combat against it. And it's um, there comes a time when you don't have, uh, don't want that anymore. Uh, of course, the internet um, makes a difference because um, there are some identities uh, you can't. Uh, you can't say, okay, this is a man or this is a woman, you can communicate uh, anonymous, but um, I think um, the quota could uh, change very, very much. Um, but I'm not really sure if it comes. The, the, they are always talking about old boys networks and um, they have the power and um, I'm not sure if they give away that power. Why should they? But uh, I, I think when they get it, uh, Vivian Redding and all the good politicians, then something could change for our generation, uh, for the people that are, have the same age than us. I mean. Um, one thing I would like to say about this, I think uh, preferring boys is uh, something that deeply into our culture in China. Because you know, in the past, we have a very huge proportion of uh, sex-selected abortion. Is that w one family when they um, to uh, scan it? Oh, it's a girl. They will choose to, uh, you know, lose it, and so that caused there that in the future twenty years there will be thirty million more boys than girls. And uh, but what what is interesting here is that uh, there are more girls going to universities than boys, and uh, so it caused a paradox. Uh, it could be difficult for girls to find a, um, how to say, a, a, a man that with comparable background in the future because most of the surplus of men is in the countryside. So it will be a future problem for them. Yeah. Just to comment on something that Julia said before, uh, because I also live in Munich, uh, in Munich currently, and there is something called um, the uh, Kinder Surprise. I don't know if you know that. Um, this is like basically it's like chocolate egg, which is hugely popular in um, many countries in Europe. For some, for some reason, it's not allowed in, in the States. But um, it's, it's a very old, like, traditional kind of you know, candy, and inside of it is like a little yellow box. And there is always like a puzzle in there, or like something to build together, those kind of things. And actually, this year, what really shocked me is that they introduced a new kind of this uh, eggs, which has been around for, I don't know, dozens of years, I think. And this year, they, they made it an uh, innovation. They made the same thing for girls, where you don't have to put anything together anymore. Just a, there's just a pretty something thing in there you can just put on your desk and look at it because they're, they're pink, they're pink, those eggs, and there's, you know, you don't have to think and put something together. So I was really shocked when I saw that. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, another topic I want to just quickly mention in terms of, um, you know, gender equality. Um, as I said before, we have to be much more opportunistic, and I see a huge, huge value in entrepreneurship in the future. And um, there are many statistics that show that m actually most founders nowadays are women. Um, on the one hand, uh, because some of the qualities that you need, like you know, relationship management, especially for small companies, but on the other hand, also because it's the best option often. Um, because also if you want to combine, for example, having a family and working, being self-employed, being your own boss is the best thing because then you, you don't have a glass ceiling. You can you make, uh, make your own decisions. And that's, I think, for, especially for our generation, is going to be a huge opportunity to start our own companies and make our own decisions and not being confronted with sexism or things like that along the way. 
Um, I can't really decide if I think the gender equality debate is actually moving forward or if it's stagnating. Um, I think it depends on country. Um, but one thing that I think we kind of constantly have to remind ourselves is the income gap. Um, I think there's a research saying that 1531 every day women can go home because that's when their salary stops um, or when they stop earning for that day compared to men. Um, this is something that, you know, no matter where you are in the labor market, this is constantly there. Uh, it doesn't matter which power position you have. Uh, and I think the move has to be from basing the income on sex and, and base it on skills uh, and look at the individual skills, uh, which is not done. And I, a lot of you have mentioned sexism uh, in the labor market. Uh, at the same time, I also think that the debate has to continue. It has to move even further, introducing queer uh, and talking about that, you know, even moving from uh, different sexes and, and really looking at individuals uh, is something that I would really like to see uh, all over the globe. And, and the knowledge on, on gender equality is really lacking. I mean, I've heard a man talking about affirmative action for men. That's not how it's working. That's not why affirmative actions exist, uh, at least not from my point of view. So we kind of have to, to also talk more about the knowledge of gender equality and why it's important. Do we have any audience questions so far? Yeah, in the front here. As I said before, it's really all about creativity because the, as we heard many, many times in this conference, the key drivers for growth in the future will be innovation, things like that, or relationships, all those kind of things. And in the current education system, it's just not given. And even like when we start in a company, people like, might say then, yeah, you, you're young, just sit down and learn. Just watch us doing what we do. And um, whenever we have an idea or something that's kind of, it, oftentimes, I'm not saying always, but oftentimes uh, it gets suppressed. And if you receive that throughout your education and then in the beginning of your work, you kind of, you, you that's a skill that you forget. I mean, children are, extremely creative. And then once they are finished with university, they're not anymore. So there must be something in between kind of, you know, that, that stopped them from being so extremely creative. Um, and it might have worked before because of those kind of structures, because of this kind of guiding path, but we will have to be creative in the future. Our generation has to have innovative ideas, uh, be entrepreneurial, um, know about design, marketing, those kind of things. Otherwise it will just not work for our generation. Something I grew up with is learning by doing. Uh, it's not really a skill, but it's a way of learning skills. Uh, and it's really about being allowed to try something. Uh, I project managed when I was 15. I had parti 500 participants at, at evening events. Uh, and that's quite a lot for a 15 year old and have a, a huge budget as well, because someone believed in me and they let me try it. And by trying and sometimes failing and learning from your failure or learning from your successes, you also build self-esteem. And I think that's very important, especially in relation to what you're saying about creativity, to being allowed to try to test your creativity, to foster your creativity. Uh, that's really something that I think you can do in private sectors as well as, as elsewhere uh, in schools as well. I think this is actually just building directly on that. Um, one of the things that I found most surprising about business school was I was expecting to go and learn accounting and finance and operations management, uh, but were the, the leadership classes uh, which pushed us to, to think about what our values are, what our passions are, and how to develop leadership from, from those. And I think companies um, have a lot to do to grow in terms of helping their employees um, build a leadership style around their passions and their values and, 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 and incorporating those into work. And I think, um, I think it's a great way to, to reach women because I think women enjoy that, that those kinds of exercises generally. Uh, but I also think it's a, it's a great way of, of um, developing long-term leaders and it's something that I want to continue to, to try and do in my career. 
and I want to say for Chinese students, I think it's communication skills. Because uh, when I started studying abroad, uh, the foreign student told me that they always have a perception that Chinese students like to gather with their own small groups. But um, that's the because that's what we are growing up. We are um, in school. We uh, absorb what the teacher teaches us. But uh, in here, I found uh, the students are learning more from a way that arguing with the teacher or have a conversation with the teacher. That's totally different from what we are learning in, in the past. So, um, so I think Chinese students should be maybe more open, uh, open up to uh, adopt uh, different cultures and to learn how to communicate with GX and uh, yeah. As a nature director, what kind of processes have you put to deal with that genuine uh, challenges? Um, first, I think, thank you, because I think uh, the, the debate is absolutely fascinating. So as a company, we have to, to include uh, this uh, new generation uh, within the company. And as it was mentioned, it's a very different uh, way of working. So we have to coach as well the, the, the managers to understand and to act uh, with these people. For instance, in the factories, when we start with uh, a new generation, uh, sometimes the way to behave to hierarchical authority is very different. And uh, for instance, in the factories, we have to teach to the, to the people and uh, uh, where are the leaders of the team, how to deal with uh, these new people, how they have to accept that the people are challenging them and asking why and not uh, just doing the things as they were used to do. Um, on the other hand, for instance, I think the, what was mentioned about Generation Y, we have a lot of cross-functional teams within the organization. And these uh, cross-functional teams are looking at uh, how to improve business, how to improve uh, uh, opportunities. And we have a lot of young people on that one. That's a good way, as I mentioned, how we can use for the benefits of both uh, the qualities of, uh, of the young people. Um, to integrate as well a Generation Y, we have a lot of uh, social media internally. Uh, for instance, we have a network for women with more than 3,200 people. We have, a, uh, we have now a, a website when we, you can, not, uh, you can uh, discuss about business issue and stuff like that. And it's very interesting to see that uh, a lot of uh, young people within the company are on that one. I have a few more ones, but maybe it's just three examples. And are you willing to give them the power? <laughs> of course, they, you will because have the, the, the power. The, That's she, she clear because it's mathematical. Do you know? You <laughs> All generation like me will move away, and new generation will come. I'm very happy. I say, I'm mother of three generation Y, and I'm very happy they could have the power <laughs> as well. Hello there. We've heard about how um, for Gen Y, maybe GDP or the bottom line profitability of an organization is not one of the most important measures for you. So I'm interested to hear what are the, um, the maybe non-traditional metrics that you are using to, to measure, be it social or economic growth today. I'm presuming it's not just the number of Facebook friends that you have. Um, I like every human rights index that you can find because they show something different about our society. Um, I think in our generations, many things boil down to the individual level. And if I myself have the perception that things are improving, if the people around me give me this kind of positive you know, information, if I hear from them, I think, because I personally don't trust too much in statistics and even in news because it all can be, you know, controlled or biased or anything. So I think it's really a personal feeling. So, um, and yeah, it depends on the, on the people you surround yourself with, so. I actually uh, worked for an organization, a social responsible investing organization uh, and, and helped them develop their global, their global rating system, which evaluates their economic and social, uh, social impacts, so all the non-financial non impacts. And we looked at it across uh, companies' impacts on communities, employees, the environment, shareholders, and uh, consumers. And I think that you, you have to look at all of those. You can't just look at, at 
like you're saying, at profitability. Um, so it's, and it's a, really <laughs> it's a really complicated thing to do. It was very, very challenging to, to redo our rating system to make it global because you have different, different values in every country, you have different systems in every country. So it's, it's hard to, to um, evaluate companies on all these different metrics. But I think, I mean, one thing that I think is really exciting is, is that this, this space is getting more and more attention. And I think we will have, I'm hoping, uh, a standard rating system that is not just profitability within the next 10 years that's used across companies. Yeah. I know not all of you are, can you guys hear me? If I don't have a microphone. Okay. I know not all of you are in business, but if you were to describe your dream corporate environment, Um, definitely allowing us to be entrepreneurs within an organization. So all those things that are typical for entrepreneurs, like you know, being able to find our opportunities we want to work on ourselves, uh, being able to put in our own creative ideas into the work, being able to um, have a say in what is done. <clears throat> all of those things are hugely important because just kind of you know listening to a boss and just doing whatever he does all day sitting in front of a computer and typing away might work for some people but in, for gen y most people want to have this more, more control more um creativity have their voices heard so yeah really kind of this entrepreneurial environment i will more uh, w like to work in a multinational firm and uh, with different cultures and backgrounds i like to learn not only professional skills but also to develop my uh, like for example interpersonal skills uh, this is tricky i i actually really like the work environment that i work in now but i don't want to sound like i'm a spokesperson so i'll bet i can describe <laughs> some of the things um the, the, the two elements that you just touched on, a global environment is very important, uh, flexibility and the option, opportunity for creativity in a non-hierarchical environment is very important, being challenged constantly, exceptionally important, um, having leaders that I admire and that I feel like are interested in my development and personally care about me is also very important. Um, there's a couple other ones. I think especially as I look at, at my career at a company that, that has um, uh, flexibility around uh, different options at different points in your career, one that, uh, that allows women to have families and take more flexible models uh, is also something that, that I'll continue to, to look for. And the, I think the last one actually for me, which is really important, is, is working in teams. So being surrounded by people that I, that I really like working with and having a fair amount of my time spent working face to face with them. Okay, um, I would like uh, to write texts and uh, making debates. Uh, these are the things I, I like and I want to do them in the future. Um, this thing uh, to be not alone is important, but I don't know how to realize it. If it's important to um, go to a job every day and meet people there, or if it's important to connect with other people on the internet, I'm, I haven't uh, made the decision yet. Um, what I don't want to do when I work is uh, organizing, uh, making uh, appointments, and doing my tags. I think it's all a question of motivation, because if the corporation gives us the tools that we need to be passionate about our work and be motivated about it, then we will do our best. And we have a lot of offer. We have creative ideas. We ask why, why, why. We challenge. Um, so we do possess the skills to make a company very profitable. But for that, we need to be uh, you know, let free and be allowed to do those things and be motivated especially to do those things. Uh, one key thing that um, uh, Claire just touched on was learning. Um, there's nothing worse for Gen Wipers than coming to a company 
um, being maybe trained for half a year or one year, and after that just doing the same thing for several years, that's we will be, there will be zero motivation. Um, in this uh, study that um, was mentioned before, um, people were actually asked, like, you know, what, what, what are your main priorities? And financial independence was surprisingly actually not in the top three, uh, which is very different for previous uh, generations. So, and a corporation has to find ways to really motivate us to give our best, because we definitely will, once we, you know, find that what we do is important and counts. I think, I mean, you probably realize from my list uh, that I'm a fairly demanding employee, but um, when in, in the environment, I think once those things are in place, I feel exceptionally grateful and very loyal to the company that I work for, and uh, I'm certainly in it to win it, yeah. So I'm willing to, to drive towards profitability, but I, and, and all the other things that I mentioned as well, but I, I definitely uh, invest in making my office and my company as sustainable as I can. Um, so, um, when I prepared for this session, uh, I read on the internet that uh, the Generation Y is um, changing its working place often, and so I'm a little bit surprised to hear that from you. Um, I see myself, I don't see myself uh, as part of this uh, Generation Y, and for me it's really important to get love from my chef and to um, that the people say to me, okay, you do a good job for our newspaper and uh, this is really good and then I'm really motivated. But I think this is a gap uh, between that. What is always said about that uh, Generation Y that is mobile and changing its uh, place very often. So um, I think it's, uh, I want to find out wh wh what is um, the gap now. I, I do think, and I can't remember where I read this or what exactly the stat was, but that women tend to be more loyal to their, their employers or they tend to stay in positions longer. So I don't know if that's part of, of the gap. Because I, I do know the stats that, that we will have seven careers over the course of our lifetime or, so and many other. I think the main reason, I mean, it's true, we do move on to many new jobs, but again, this, the key reason for that is that those kind of things we need to stay long with one company are just not given yet. And one of those main things, again, is the learning. I mean, I know that consultancy companies are <coughs> very good at this. You have a very good learning curve, you, you know, advance, but in other companies, you're just stuck. And I think a problem also for women, actually, is that we are sometimes not, don't have the ego or not bold enough to just come to the boss and say, hey, I want to go on the next level. And we just tend to, you know, do a fantastic job, but just always kind of stay somewhere in the middle management or something. And um, that's one reason. And, yeah, and the other one, basically, if we get bored in our generation, we leave. We look for other opportunities because there are many out there. Uh, it's not, you know, just picking anymore between company A and company B in our uh, city. It's about, do I go to... China or India. It's about do I start my own company in America or do I, you know, do my PhD in Europe or there's just so many options. So in order to keep us and especially in order to keep the, the best talents, there has to be a lot offered as well. Uh, when Claire uh, described her uh, workplace in the future, uh, I completely agree. You kind of described my workplace. Uh, but I wanted to add one thing, which is that I don't think I could work in a place that only, only focus on making money, which is then very uh, interesting with your question because I realize that's why businesses exist, but they also exist for something else, making something else uh, in terms of other values. I mean, either helping out in, in an area, we heard a lot of good examples for that in society, or just producing something. And I think everybody in a company should have a position where they can contribute to the, con the company's success, not necessarily the profit, the economic profit of the company. Um, but then, of course, you will always have people that need a job because they need a house, they need food on the, on the, on the table, uh, and they might not be loyal because they haven't found their dream position. Um, and then you still have to cater for them, you still have to give them the opportunity to, to grow and learn. Um, I definitely hope that I will find that workplace where I can grow, where I love my, my work and I look forward to going there every day. Uh, but I'm not necessarily sure that that will be the case throughout my whole life. Um, so. We have time for one more question. Here we go in the back.
competition from the other markets in the country as well. You actually have to make compromises yourself because the job site might offer some of those things that you want, but not all of it. So I'd like to hear what are the compromises that you would be willing and you know, ready to make to actually fit into the environment when you're not always able to shape it to your needs and wants. Um, I think it's a great question because actually that's a big difference between the past generations and ours, security. Because for past generations, security has been the key thing. You know, finding a company where we can stay your whole life, having, you know, a secure paycheck, being, you know, kind of safe in your environment. Um, nowadays, it's really about those other, like first meeting all those other needs, like learning, like uh, balancing your life, like doing all of those things. And then it's about security because we are more mobile. We know, okay, if, if it doesn't work out here, we can move to the other side of the world and find something there. So there's, there are options out there. Of course, it's, it's difficult in the economic crisis. Um, we're all aware of that, but there are good options if you're mobile, if you embrace new values. So security is yeah, not that important anymore, I would say. Uh, personally, I think uh, there's a problem in China because many graduates can't find their ideal jobs. The good positions are very limited. And uh, once you're a graduate, it's really hard for you to get an ideal job to do what you want to do. But personally, I prefer uh, like a development uh, to see if there is a hope for future development and self-improvement. So uh, China now has a special position, it's very interesting, it's called a countryside officer for graduate students. Is that to send you to a small village and you, you to be an officer here and lead the village to develop. I think it's quite a good idea to help those graduates to let them know uh, the situation in the countryside and on the, on the same time they help China for further growth, yeah. Do you think that job satisfaction is more important than financial stability in the long run? I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah, this is just for, for anyone on the panel. No, that's exactly what the study showed and also what I saw in many conversations I had is, I mean, of course, the basic needs have to be covered, but everything, I mean, there are many motivational theories about, you know, money and everything, and they show that, you know, once a certain, um, yeah, limit is covered, you don't get motivate, uh, motivated by getting more money. So, and instead, like, the question is, like, what else is there? <clears throat> I think, um, and if a company wants to really attract top level, like, for example, um, what Google does, you know, they offer benefits that have nothing to do with, you know, like, financial things, but it's really kind of to just increase employee satisfaction, and that way they can have, you know, to refuse 199 out of 200 applicants, you know? So, because they just take the top of the top, and everyone wants to go and work there. Do you have any final comments from members of the panel? Or are we good? All right, we'll close it there. I wanted to thank so much our panelists today for such a probing and nuanced conversation. Um, and thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon.